All right. So I had a collaborative session yesterday with, our, with two of our students. We have well over 100 students enrolled in this unit. You wouldn't know, would you? <laughs> so, um, and because I run this unit, you know how when you teach, you think whatever you do is really important. And, uh, but not everybody thinks this way. And that's all right. That one has to sort of let go, as we were talking earlier. Um, so logging in is important. Following up stuff is important. You might have noticed that I do things a little bit differently than it is done in many places, like schools and so on. It's very important. I don't bring to you old stuff. I bring to you um, stuff from interdisciplinary stuff and stuff that typically goes on under critical pedagogy. And critical doesn't mean off the planet. It means bringing understanding. Some things we'll be doing today, actually, little exercises. Uh, bringing understandings from different fields to show us actually what we actually do. So you do it with little children. People did it to you. You've done something and your friend said to you, what well, do you think it was fair? And you say, that was all right. I didn't intend anything wrong with it. And what, do you, and what your friend says to you, well, how would you feel if I did that to you? A little substitution, right? So that's what critical means. You replace one thing with another and you see whether it still looks the same. So all the big definition of critical, here it is. <laughs> you know how you, I've got PhD students I've had in the past who would do thesis in um, critical thinking, and they would say, Anya, Anya, there is no definition of critical thinking. I said, well, made up, make up one. That makes sense. You can work with it, you can run with it. So there was one. And we actually did it yesterday on Collaborate when I was trying to link up what we do in classes and the assignments. So, of course, the main issue is how do you think of literacy? And Lyle, our friend, uh, he said, um, it's usually broadly defined. And I did a little substitution test, which is at the wedding, when the celebrant asks you, would you like to have this woman as your wedded wife? You say, well, broadly speaking, <laughs> sometimes you actually have to make up your mind so that you know what you're doing. <laughs> you want to marry her or not? It's a yes and no question. Do you know what literacy is or not? It's a yes and no question. There's no, broadly speaking, many definition, nobody knows, right? So that's pretty much it. And he, he was laughing on collaborate, but that's it. And then we did another thing. What was it? Um, yeah, I can't remember what it was, but we did a kind of substitution test of that kind yesterday in regard to something else yesterday. And it's quite revealing how much you can actually do with a little substitution test, how you can actually see things from another perspective. And all of a sudden, what was really good doesn't look anymore that good <laughs> from another angle. So there. Um, so th we did these little exercises yesterday. Has any one of you tried to think a little bit about the, I don't know whether I'm recording, I forgot, about the task I have challenged you with, which is um, thinking about the little teaching activity you might create while using the types of applications I have shown you over the last two lectures. And that's nine o'clock. Uh, you probably are uh, of English background, so you didn't have your coffee. You probably had tea. Tea doesn't do it. <laughs> I had my two cups. Look, I'm going. <laughs> I'm all go. So, <laughs> did you? Ha I, I we discussed it yesterday on the collaborate, and um, Rhonda said she tried, <laughs> and that was it. So I get it, I get it, so it's not easy. That's why we're doing this here, it's not easy. Any one of you?
Okay, so, so basically what this is the, the, uh, an example for uh, middle school and the idea is for students to hear themselves. It's a great beginning. It's a great beginning. Because it's pretty much the same as I was just talking about the linguistic substitutions. Um, it's actually better than I actually started talking about it. Okay, because linguistic substitution, what does it do? Allows you to look at yourself from another angle. Or what does hearing yourself do? Have you ever taped yourself and listened to yourself? It's on the recent like and actually listened to my lectures. The lectures I recorded years ago. I recorded them and I ran away from them. I thought, it's you who has to re listen to them. I cannot even bear listening to myself. I couldn't. Um, I also have a very strong accent for many reasons, which we will maybe one day understand it or not, but I'm, uh, today I'm not going into it. Uh, but one day I thought to myself, all right, I know so much about linguistics, surely I can get at least one sentence right, right? So I went to my telephone, answering machine. I recorded myself, you know, you could leave a message here if you want to, if you don't, just go home. <laughs> I played it with all the understandings I know about English, as much as I could monitor at that given moment, I sounded like Hillary Clinton. Do you think I liked it? What do you think I did with it? Killed it. <laughs> also, in, we do acoustic phonetics, a lot of uh, what we call the verbotonal approach to, um, to everything, actually, to, to, uh, un to learning. But it from, comes from acoustic phonetics, and acoustic phonetics does teach you that you hear yourself through your skull differently than actually, like, within your, like when we're listening our, to ourselves, we hear ourselves differently than we hear ourselves when we actually get it from the tape. It's a, it's a, the brain is hearing it differently for some reason. Children who stutter, what they have a problem with? No idea? They have a problem actually with hearing themselves. Did you know that? Okay. They have a problem with hearing themselves. What happens is when you actually say something, and you can test it yourselves easily, when you actually say something in order to say the next thing, you actually are in a loop. You have to hear yourself, and then you produce another one. What children with uh, who stutter they have, they have a delay in the information coming back to the ear. So they say the thing is not coming into your ear at, at the split of a, I mean, at the billionth of billionth of a second, and they can't produce another thing because they are still processing what they said. We, of course, did it in, because I was doing acoustic phonetics in the University of Queensland um, as a researcher, but we did, you can do it when you play something loud and you also want to talk to a person. You, the music is so loud or someone else's talk is so loud that you can't actually hear yourself and as a result you can't talk because you can't hear what you just said. It's not just cognitive that popped out from your head and you think you could just go on. Can't. So hearing yourself is excellent. That's exactly what it is. That's what we did. Yeah, we we you see we did a lot of acoustic phonetics with old tape recorders, and for some reason they were very suitable for this analog technology was very suitable for it. Now it's actually uh, the people I worked with, they just don't have that equipment anymore. It's all it's finished. So their PhD students are suffering because they can't actually experience this hands on, unless they get expensive stuff like that or they know where to look for. Th you know, you have to buy special things. I don't know, but that's a great thing. That's exactly what it is. Okay, so we have discussed that. Has that listening to yourself relevant or hearing yourself relevant in terms of what it means to be literate?
Okay, as you can see that we're having a lively discussion, but what actually it does, I don't challenge you. I want you to actually feel, because there's, there's no marks for it, right? And you can't say wrong and you can't say right because everything is stupid. Do you know why? There's no such a thing like truth. We're basically little people trying to do our job as good as we can. And researchers too, they just look for explanations or, or for ways of solving things. Nobody is actually trying to construct the knowledge about the world. And in fact, if you actually had some, and in, in fact, we, um, I just wanted to betray secrets of my class today, so I'm just stopping myself. And in fact, what happens is, in fact, the newest research in neuroscience confirms what we could have also known, but it's good to have a confirmation of it. We are only as good as our last ancestry. We are, we actually don't see the world. We see the world as the history of our ancestry allowed us to say. I think I made that point a couple of weeks ago as well when I was telling you that literacy or being in the world or reading is kind of a 4D picture. And someone else says it, um, Marian, Marian Wolf says it too. I've got that clip actually here. She says the same, which is good to hear. Uh, I probably didn't invent it myself. I also follow someone else. So that's why we're all converging. We are all converging. So, um, so basically, we don't see the world, neuroscience says. We see the world as our physiology, which is our past, allows us to see. And everybody in whether in clinical psychology or neuroscience or even in computer technology because they work with artificial intelligence, they will tell you 99.9.9.9.9% of the world we don't see. You've seen that lecture by Jordan Peterson with me, the last lecture in EAL 201. Remember we did that and you said, had I played it in the beginning of the course, you wouldn't have understood anything. At the end, it's all clear. Um, so, we don't see the world, we basically see it through stories. Again, being literate, what does this mean now? The more, the, ex the more expensive you are, the more you see. The more you can work with information, the more you see, the more literate you are, the more you see in the world where we're supposed to not see too much. If we see too much, what happens? Like children who are uh, autistic, they can't block the signals. That's why they can paint the world as they see it in all the little um, pixels. They look at it and there it is, they can draw it. They can't look people in the face because, why can't they look at, uh, in the eyes of people? Why can't they look people in the eyes? What happens, why? Any ideas? What do you think I'm testing now? Your knowledge of neuroscience? No. I'll, I'll ask you questions, some, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm testing now. Anyway, because the processing, because of the processing, we see a picture, we think we see a picture, just your face or your face. In fact, we see millions or thousands of them coming into our brain all the time and judging. That's how you can read someone's character or what they think, whether they are lying, because all these things are coming in. You block, you look for the relevant according to your ancestry and according to your own experiences. They do too, but at the rate that is unmanageable and it creates pain. So they have to either hurt themselves to refocus the pain somewhere else and therefore lessen it, or they don't look at you because they can't. It hurts them. How do I know it's all over the internet and I know it from many, for many reasons anyway, but that's how it, what happens. They need to block information. They can't block it. Whereas we are excellent at blocking it.
Okay, so what if a child repeats, and that is what autism does, what autism, it shows us the extreme of the normal, right? So just like when you go to another culture and people do things differently, it's not that they don't know how to do things, they just do the same things, but differently. It shows you the extreme, to you it's an extreme, like you are to them, of possibilities. So if a child hears something and repeats the whole sentence as one word, what does this say from literacy perspective? Well, it's a management of information now. What's, question, what's interesting here, the fact that we think that there are words it's, a, it's, it's an outcome of our technology. Um, in my newest paper, I actually, because I watch everything on the YouTube, that's why I'm hyper, but <laughs> um, it's debatable when it started because cultures, as the, as, the, as the weather changes, so the links between people break and we have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. So the idea that we started in, in, uh, in a Sumerian thing, it has, come, it has become pushed back now to all the way to the Aldovian caves in France or wherever, like 25,000, 30,000 years ago. The point is, in all of these situations, these caves, and they find tablets with attempts to start with technologies which start to break things down. Information technology. Information technology is a technology of managing information. So whether we actually speak with words or sentences or thoughts or whatever, we will never know. But organizing things in words helps us to manage things better. So what the child is not doing, what you have, um, it's not that what he is not doing, but from the perspective of our social life, you notice that he is not, he, he needs to now look at his production a little bit differently, which will help him to see things in his production he didn't see before. It's not that we have to push them into words, sentences, commas, dots, uh, columns, and so on. That's just technology. But what you're saying is technology is great. So if you actually look, if I slow it down for you, or like I was showing to you with this software last week, say only half of a word, you realize that there is a word. Because if you only say half of it, it means nothing. You enable now to look at the production differently, right? So the technology that we have allowed us to see ourselves as maybe not just producing chunks of thoughts or expressing, but maybe we, can, we actually do have words and sentences and all of that. Um, there's a professor, by the way, talking about others, professor, I can't remember her Christian name because she's got this weird Christian name. Temple, Professor Temple. If you type in YouTube, Professor Temple Autism, uh, she's a veterinary scientist. And in order to get that high with autism, she actually used her reflective capacities, because they all have it, to manage herself. And what she does, it's a very drastic example. She goes to abattoirs, you know, abattoir, that's what it is. And she puts her head in those wooden objects, which kind of stunt the cow. Oh, I've seen, I've seen You've seen that? Yeah, seen she needs to defocus herself from everywhere onto one. She needs to reduce the pain. She needs to, she needs to actually focus herself. And by pushing physiologically on her, on her body, on her head, actually, she actually, start, she actually regains focus. Otherwise, she's sensitize, she sees everything. When you see everything, you see nothing. And that just goes throughout the whole science. And before we go one further, I would just want to fix something for assignment one, because this, I've got two things to do with you today. That's what I planned. And they are synonymous. So there is no like, if, we, if once you know that, you will know that, right? It's like, they're synonymous. So I just don't know which one to do first. But this, now it seems like the way to go. You know how in assignment one, you have to write your examples of being a literate person. 
and I, many of you haven't because once you are in on-campus lectures, you don't watch the videos, which is all right. But sometimes when I, especially in the lecture, not last week, but the week before, I included the chimp story. Maybe I should put the chimp story <laughs> as a separate story. Anyway, so I point in assignments that recognizing letters and being able to read and seeing order, even a chimp can, I mean, even a dog can do, but you know, so when someone says to me, will I participate on Facebook? So I say, how does that make you literate? Because I can read and write. Also, can a chimp? Is this what we are after with our children? Right. So obviously, what I point out on the, to the uh, when I actually look at these drafts, I point out that your definition of literacy is not operative enough. It's not good enough because you cannot distinguish between what the literate person is and what basically is being able to participate in a simple, well, Facebook might be a complex activity. The point is you have to actually argue it. You know how academia loves arguments? You can't tell me that Facebook is about being literate. You've got to actually show it to me. So what I was thinking now, just it's going to take only 30 seconds. And then, and then another question is going to take another 30 seconds, and we'll just have it done. What do you do in your real life that you can say to me, look, Anya, I'm good. I do lots of interesting things that show that I'm a literate person. The reason why I'm asking this is because People tend, and that's a research in sociology, and not, not by some person again from somewhere. This is Craig Calhoun and all his mates. Craig Calhoun used to be a professor of history and sociology at the University of New York. Now he is now in Cambridge. The, oh, Oxford, I can't remember, can't follow. Uh, the point is, these are the shakers. These are the big people that you read. If you don't read those, you don't have to agree with them, but you read them. You don't have to read Daniel Lyon, but you have to read Craig Calhoun. Um, so what they say, whether it's the internet or whether it's home or whether it's anything, people tend to do always the same things. So if you, and they interact always with the same people. So the problem of the internet, and I have developed, a, anyway, what Facebook has done was um, actually an attempt to break away from that pattern. So there's no accident that people who invented Facebook come from MIT and all of these places because they read Craig Calhoun. It's not like he sat down and dreamt it out. I had, and that's what I was going to say, but I published it in 2006, the Dictionary of Concepts, which was like a Facebook, but it was an intellectual thing, which is what I wanted to actually do here, and I got rejected. But I'm still going to do it. <laughs> thing is, these people don't invent stuff because they had a good day. Their courses are designed to do that. Whether in, Stanford, in Stanford, actually, a lot, of, a lot of things that people use today, a lot of applications, a lot of stuff that is available today came out from a creativity course run as a regular unit in Stanford University. They have to do it in that unit. And amazing things happen. So tell me, tell me, what do you do that shows you are a literate person. And forget about the reading and writing. Anya, I can read your PowerPoints. We, I could contest it. That's why I'm talking to them, in order, because I know that nobody can. Right? It's reading is not reading. And that's why we have lectures. That's why we have collaborate sessions. That's why I shot this whole thing on YouTube. Because the text, doesn't matter who wrote it, doesn't talk to you. You still need to dialogize. You still need to problematize. Okay, so tell me <laughs> one example. You are a literate person. Come on, guys. We love these discussions. Imagine you're seven years old. The teacher comes to school and says, okay, that example of reading the PowerPoint won't work. Think of another one. You know, when they're seven, they're going to scream out 300. 
but because you have inhibitions, you know the game. <laughs> You're not gonna get me. <laughs> All right. Any examples? Yeah, but so what? It doesn't make it the illiterate person. What it does say is, you know that writing a CV is not a simple thing. That's being literate. Not that I help them. Just wait. Let's hold it there. That's what we did on collaborate session yesterday. Someone said something, and then... I said, well, a lot of things we know here, but we need to verbalize them, talk about them, and learn to talk about them in an orderly way. Why? Not only to show that we're literate, but then once we're conscious of it, and once we actually understand how to think of it in an orderly way, we can teach it. So it's not always relying on your intuition. You actually start to reorganize and make it really clear. And when you go to classroom, you have a principle. So when everybody goes nuts in your classroom, when children start doing rapping and all of that, you don't fight it. You know how to work with it. Whereas I've seen in schools here around Darwin where people were fighting it. I didn't see a problem with an Aboriginal seven-year-old child doing the rap across the room. Do you see a problem with that in your literacy classroom? Can you work with it? You don't have to dominate children. You work with them. Everybody thought it was funny and cool, except for the teacher. And subsequently, the uh, pre-service student had to also think that seven-year-old boy was a monster. Sad, isn't it? Imagine it was your child, who just at this very moment, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and he woke up, and he's going to do this. So, we're verbalizing. So, what you do say to me, I'm a literate person because I know that one CV is not the same as the other CV. It's not simple. Now, you can get me, Anya, whether I do it right or wrong, right? But I will tell you, Anya, there's no such a thing like a perfect resume. There's no such a thing like a perfect thing. But what it is, it's awareness that it's not simple makes me now what? Do what? Think. Strategize. Strategize. What else? You would know, because you said it last time, two weeks ago. What else? What does a literate person do? You're always working with intuition. A literate person reads. So when she's writing a CV and knows it's not a simple thing, but she needs to invent strategies. What does the literate person then do? You go on the net and you look for someone else's resume and you can see whether what you're doing is comparable, better, or what can be improved, right? It can be just you. We're living in a culture, what I call the culture of my recent paper. It's a new learning culture. You're not on your own. You are independent because you can connect. And that's, that's a different kind of independence, right? Not isolated, loony, but independent because you're empowered through connections. Yeah, you can check. Great. Do you charge for it? No, they're friends. No, I just... <laughs> down the track, it might be something else in the industry, but it's just become a thing that, um, yeah, a lot of my friends, every time... And it's always um, government jobs, government jobs, mm. every time my friends want to mm. Look, do a little business, a little business on, on, on the web, create a little website thing, business thing, and see how it goes. Create a pay, pay, web, uh, Facebook page as well. It's excellent. But you see how, how we, she, we can, when we argue, if, if someone writes me an assignment and says, I, I, do, I, help out, I help out people do CV, I go, so what? I talk. I read. So what? So what? It's not an argument. It's not an example. That's why I say to people, go and reread my comments on other people because it's not an example. Example is, look, literacy is what? And therefore, I do this. So what's, what's literacy now that we define literacy? What, in, in the, what's your name? Pardon me? 
Christina, right? So Christina gave us an example of the CVs. What can we learn about literacy from that example? That information management is not simple. Remember how we did substitution tests? Little substitution exercises to look at the same thing differently. When you go on the web and check someone else's CV examples, or resume examples, you are now taking your chair and you look at your work from a different angle. And is it still looking the same? <laughs> What are you learning? What, the, what are you learning now? It's a cultural context. No, you're learning to choose, to, to pick and choose, to select. We do nothing else in life. We never hear anything. We never understand anything. And actually neuroscience confirms it, but we knew it from acoustic phonetics. You never hear anything or see anything. You select according to predictions. So if you don't have sources, your predictions are based on the narrow, on very narrow base. You need to look at how Americans do it. You need to look how the Polish people do it. You need to look how the French do it, because there will be always one nugget. What do we know about the Americans? They can sell themselves. You don't have to do it th their way, but you can have a look what's in it for me. And it's always like that. doesn't matter whether my, it's my lecture or someone else's book or someone else's lecture. What's in it for me? and then you argue it to get a good grade. You don't repeat, you argue. All right, so doing CVs, what else? What have you heard recently, which is astonishing, other than my lectures? What did you hear recently or saw it? What did you do literate that the literate person does recently that is astonishing? And it, it was astonishing to you, was great, you feel good about it. So CVs, what else? Right, so this is an excellent example. This is a very good example. So what you do, you have read enough, you have looked enough, you have engaged critically with information, and now you're looking at your practice, and you're thinking, in the light of what I feel and what I understand, there is a gap here. There is a gap here. I'm not sure whether I can fill it and I can do things better. The point is I see it. And that already sets you apart, sets you on the path of your own. What I'm actually trying to do is, and, and um, is to, I'm not just a teacher, I'm a mentor and I'm a leader on all of these things. I'm just trying to mother you a little bit and <laughs> tell you what an old woman does <laughs> and how useful it is. I find it astonishing that a lot of my colleagues in the education, in the field of education, the video of Ken Robinson, which was in 2010, published, they didn't get it until 2012-13. They didn't see it. I saw it. There is research in neuroscience, nobody knows anything about it. My latest publication has stopped, it was published on YouTube only three days before I submitted my publication. Three days. How did I find it? Because YouTube, you know. What does YouTube do? How many of you know that? How many of you will be writing that in your assignment? How literate are you? There is a world of knowledge out there. Every person on this planet, or well, not quite, but those who can, are contributing for that benefit. And so many intellectuals are so away from it. So I open YouTube, it shows me what, I have, what I'm likely to like because I subscribe to channels or because of particular tendencies. What do you do to help the YouTube to give you good selections? You subscribe, what else? 
you subscribe to channels so you can see what these channels have published lately, right? What else can you do? Any, do you know? Yes, when you like or dislike, YouTube also makes selections. People don't know it. Colleagues of mine in my, at my workplace don't know it. But a lot of kids do. Now about inter uh, so so there is a lot of tools out there that allow you to keep up with yourself. Because what what's the point of education? This is this is just this is the little introduction before we start the big things today. What's the point of education? What's education to do? Right? We're teachers. We should actually, other than literacy, we should actually define the goal of education. What's the goal of education? I use always one word for it because, look, at my age, I reduce everything to just one word. <laughs> education is a Okay, would you like to get wedded to this person and you go, well, broadly speaking, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Good attempt. But what would you say? Education in broad terms. Okay, so this is our building block, right? Nobody comes up with a gold nugget straight away. We need building blocks. As you said, your child has, or you said, you know, they want them here, but they're here. You, you thought that your child was here, whereas he just showed you he was here, right? So we've got our building blocks. Let's reconstruct it. So what did you say again? It's education in broad sense. Yes. Yes, it's education in broad sense. Academic education. That too. Okay, academic education, that's exactly what I'm talking about, yes. So in the broad sense, so she's talking about the broad sense. That's very interesting because yesterday I was looking for someone who actually to say that in the lecture I attended, in a seminar, pardon me, it was like a big, big guest thing and they didn't know that. So, but I would like a more precise word. How can we now make it into something that everybody can see as a one word or something? Broad sense. How can we make it more precise? Make it more precise. It's not one word, but you can make it more That's reconstruction, right? So, so, so the path to do that is, is individual processing. We have to cater for that. How people actually, their questions, their needs, their questions, their interests, all of that, right? So that's the path for it. But what's the goal? What's the destiny? Education learn. Empowerment. Good. Okay, well, I'll give you my word because they are all good words. Okay, I just, I talk about it. I borrowed it from University of Technology from Sydney. Long time ago. You wouldn't believe it. When I was, I don't think I was even employed, I was still doing, my, there was a time I took off to finish my PhD because my PhD students were finishing and I wasn't finishing, I was too distributed. I took time off, but I thought of a number of things. One of them was every week while living in Canberra, I would drive to Sydney for the fun of it and I would attend seminars that they had at UTS on education. And I borrowed a lot of words from them. And this one is a key word. It's expansion. Love that word. Okay. Because it talks about stretching a person, the broad thing you were talking about. The learning, the broad thing, right? Has expansion going to happen when you always do the same thing? Research shows that we always do the same thing. And, and talk to the same people or the same type of people. So if we got Facebook, we talk to more members of our family than normal. If we have website, we sit on our website or we view websites that are what we are. So how do you create an expansion when we are such repetitive or creatures of habits? Remember, how do you break the loop? How do you break out of the loops? What do you need? And what creates motivation? Motivation is really good. Actually, I like it even better than my word. So I'm just going to put it here. 
But you don't come to the classroom and say, children, <laughs> I'm going to motivate you to that. <laughs> a reason. They need to feel challenged. In the past, when I was a little bit more, um, well, I was younger, obviously. And because I used to teach PhD students, and I went to this undergraduate course, and I said something, and I didn't realize that students would take it so hostile. I used to say, you have to confuse children. And then they went to the head of school, the professor, who's my friend, and she, they said, Anya wants us to confuse children. In the world where every policy says, you've got to explain, be clear, you know, all of that. And she says, we want, <laughs> when you show things to them from another angle, what does it do? He goes, wow, there is a bit of a question there, right? What does, the, what does this tell me now about what I thought before? So I was a little bit honest. So I learned that the English word for confusion is challenge. It's more acceptable. <laughs> so now I talk about challenging people. But what I'm saying really is about bring, taking them out of their comfort zone. not by pushing them, which is what we discussed yesterday on the Collaborate, but as you said, they have to, or as you both said together, when I marry you two together, it is like they, they see the reason, not you see the reason, they have to see the reason. That's different. Especially with autistic children. Because as a mother, I don't know about you, but typically people say, What's the motto of an autistic child? I had a friend who, he's a CEO, right? But he is autistic. <laughs> uh, I will do what I want to do. And he barely could talk when his first words to his mother were, I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> You're violating their space, right? So that's a trick of a teacher, and uh, we will be solving this throughout our classes. But that's what it is. Yes, challenge leads to expansion, because otherwise they don't see the reason. But they have to see the reason. So why don't you see the reason to use YouTube for education? Could be one. Nobody showed you that, there, that that's a tool towards it, that it's a meaningful tool towards it. And that's a very important thing because that's what I will be talking <coughs> later on, not today, but some other, maybe today, I don't know, but for the next few weeks we will be doing this kind of thing. Tools. People need tools. When you come to the classroom and you say, tell me what you think about it, you go like, you're kidding. I, I, I don't know. I, I just don't have all my thoughts running at this very second. You challenge people. People feel challenged. But when you say to them, when you explore, when you look for tools together, and then you, we're thinking creatively, what can we do with these tools? It's a completely different game. You gave them things. Um, I don't necessarily agree how... Uh, um, how, uh, what is it called, accelerated, accelerated literacy is running its programs. I don't agree with, there are good principles there, but they're not used properly in my view. Um, why was I talking about tools and accelerated literacy at this very second? Pardon me? But they have one principle which is good. I have, they have many principles which are good, but they don't use them properly, which is um, you don't ask children something you don't know they have an answer to. And the way they do it sounds a little bit like a reproduction, and that's what I don't like about them, because they don't sit and critically think about this principle. They already know what that means, because they have a practice, they have a protocol. The print, there's nothing wrong with the principle, but it's very much wrong with one way of seeing its meaning. 
So when you know that children can play with this, when the question is meaningful because they have tools, all they need is your permission. When your question is a permission, that's one thing. When your question is a challenge, they feel it in their stomach, their, their, their physiological systems are shutting down, you're giving them a heart attack. But when, it's, when they're sitting on the edge and waiting for you to say, can we now, can we now, can I, <laughs> right? You're letting them go. So question can have two different functions, permission to, to run with the project and do it, or challenge and shutting their systems. At all ages, middle school, primary school, and so on. And that's why we will be looking at what I very often say, how do you ensure that your activities are designed in such a way that all children can participate on an equal basis. Your answer should be, I have given them tools and so many that they can now appropriate them according to where they, are, where they want to go. That's very different from children today, we're going to do this. You may say that in some of your prac environments, that's not the way how it's going to be accepted. You will have no tools to do it. That could be. But when I came to this university where I, when I was new, I couldn't do a lot of units when I was teaching the way how I wanted to teach them. And as a result, and I, I wasn't allowed to, nobody forbade me. It's just for whatever reasons, I was a bit constrained. But I'm not constrained in here. People want to see achievement. Other than that, do whatever you need, Anya. Right? And it comes to the point in your career where when you enter the school, maybe you will be under guidance of, some, guidance of someone. And, but there comes the point where people will say, now you fly and you lead. And by the way, he's a student from CDU. Please mentor them. And you go like, I just, I just, I just finished my practice two years ago. And go, yeah, yeah, that's enough. Well, when do you think it's enough? When you're 60? <laughs> That's how it works. So, um, tools. Teachers who come to classroom and they do unprepared. They have a lesson plan. That's it. Where are your exploratory tools? How are the children going to know things? I'm going to tell them. Oh, yeah? Has meaning working according to your past? What's the guarantee that what you tell them they will understand? Learning centered. Um, that's how we do it, Anya. Well, maybe, but not in this class. When you get out of this class, yeah, you can do whatever you want. But in this class, we're trying to challenge ourselves. I'm trying to confuse you. <laughs> we're trying to actually have a look, to have a motivation to get out of the loop. And I'm giving you tools. And you can take it wherever you want to. So there are things out there in the world that some of us are using, some of us are learning to use. And I strongly encourage you to actually get out of your habits and explore. For my subject, if you quote just YouTube videos, I'm really happy. If all you quote is Anya Lai and, and YouTube videos, that's all I want. I have quoted YouTube videos uh, in my last publication three days ago. <laughs> It's going to, uh, and I am submitting a project today on the basis of this publication, but it's going to be an international project. It doesn't harm you. These, public, the, these particular broadcasts that I am actually um, quoting are the it of neuroscience. The it, right? I'm not quoting someone's school lecture or something. I'm quoting people who are talking to hundreds because it's a venue and it's a, you know, a huge symposium and they're bringing Harvard people and all of that. That's what you quote. So just to basically be in a safe place. But you can also quote someone interesting. Say, look, provided you defend it. So there's stuff out there which is not in textbooks. Textbooks always have been, writ been written a long time ago. And um, a lot of time by people who occupied important positions. 
but they they occupy these important positions because they were within a particular tradition and linguistics used to be the discipline of literacy and of language teaching and language teaching has suffered tremendously as a result of it because language is not words and grammar the last thing language is words and grammar the last okay so what can we say about the literate person again? What, what, what do we have say? They are happy to look elsewhere. Not necessarily at neuroscience, but when you do a CV, you should actually know that there is something out there to have a look. How do I know? Darling, I charge $500 per day for the same job. <laughs> and that's what I did, but I still do that. The head of research, I say I, I work with a head of research and uh, I produce resources for my postgraduate students so that they can learn to think, to manage information. What did she ask? And, and even though it reflects my research, even though I'm really good at it, how do I know? Because my students tell me, what did I do the first thing when I was to submit something and she wanted it in a really, when I told her what I want to do, she wanted it in a particular format, her way. But I bring my own head into it, right? So I thought to myself, rather than just structure it my way, and she would be very happy with it too, I knew that. I went on the net and I looked at what's a project proposal. I mean. I've done PhD a long time ago. I've supervised students since I was 30. You would think, why would you go and check what's a project proposal? You should know, Anya. Yeah, doesn't harm to check. I went, I found beautiful stuff at, at Penn State, at UPenn, University of Pennsylvania. I found beautiful stuff. I found things like an assignment or a project proposal is a uh, what's it called? persuasive text. But I don't use those terms because I think more academically about it. I don't think this way. And I thought, beautiful. And when I wrote it, the head of research thought, I'm brilliant. Did I tell her that I got it from Google? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Because I think that's actually the fact that you actually look for information and you are able to actually open up is more important than the fact that you can shine. I was teaching a postgraduate student the other day, yesterday actually, when someone asks you a question at the conference, at your defense, how do you react? Is it a challenge? You get it here and you think this is amazing. Someone asked me a question. It gives me an opportunity to see how it relates to my work. And now, as a strong person, you say, I haven't thought about it. I can't believe it, how important it is, therefore. I thank you very much. I'll think about it and I'll see how relevant it is to my work. But I'm sorry, I can't really answer it, although I can see this and this and this is relevant. That's it. Question is not a challenge. It's, it's a way to look at your work differently. So looking at Google and checking stuff, for me, was something that, look, I thought about it to have a look what other people do. No, you don't always rely on yourself. It's a literate, it's a skill of a literate person. So, so what we say, a literate person, literate being actually, literate means having skills in information management, or more precisely, information technologies. And please do not resent it, because information technology doesn't mean the mobile phone. From the moment you started talking to your mother, you were engaging in information technology. Language is information technology. Written language is information. Painting is information technology. Everything that is about communication and symbolic representation of it is information technology. So people, even at our head of research, I had to talk, maybe she did it as a joke, but I had a presentation and just five minutes and to students, and I said, when did the information technology start? And she was thinking, like, get on with it, Anya. So she gave the answer, which was 19th century, looking at me like, 
that I knew that, and I go like minus 10,000 uh, years or even further back because people had economies and they had to actually write on tablets how much you owe me. And that became very uh, troublesome because a lot of people owed me money and I couldn't really, I just had a lot of these tablets. So we had to make it better and better and better until today we can run the banks on information technology, which started back then on start what, look, we will never know how it started, right? But what we uncover is from 30,000 years ago, we uncover horns with marks on them, according to, it's, it's an early writing. And then we uncover things in the Sumerian culture, which are tablets, and which started first with little dots and square, different, different shapes, then with tables, because tables bring things to focus and order. I'm a tables girl. I do lots of things with tables because then there's absolutely no ambiguity unless someone can't read the table. Reading table is another literacy skill. In fact, you'd be surprised how many people cannot read graphs. Not only that, some people when they produce graphs are useless graphs too. It works the other way as well. So it's about information technology, information management, literacy, and it's about Literate person is an expansive person. As someone said, looks broadly from different perspectives and looks for perspectives. And when you look for perspectives, you look for challenge. You never see yourself as the only golden nugget. I want you to see yourself as a golden nugget, that's for sure. But you're not the only one. I don't know whether you suffered of that illness when you were young, but I did. I wanted to be the prettiest. And when my boyfriend said to me, and she's pretty, and she's pretty, I went like, how dare you? <laughs> In my head, I didn't tell him that. It was a lesson, wasn't it? And then my girlfriends were always the prettiest. So I'm thinking like, mm, that's a rude awakening, is what they call it. <laughs> You're not the only one <laughs> in the world. Um, so you appreciate challenge and you work with challenges, right? You engage challenges in order to be expansive, increasingly expansive, never ends. I was listening to a lecture in neuroscience today on evolution of the brain, and they were mentioning this uh, evolutionist uh, guy from, what was his name? Uh, uh, what's that movie, 1984? Orwell, what's his name? Yeah, so his name was not Orwell, something like Orwell, kind of this biologist from the 19th century. And he used to believe particular thing, and when he was 90, before he died, he changed his mind. Isn't it lovely? And he was the one who said, um, people say that there is argument, not really anymore, but it used to be, versus maths. Okay, so basically biology says that, and brain is also, a lot of things are about predictability, which is this kind of connections we're gonna teach children so that they can be very good at prediction. But what's the guy who invented the, the um, telescope? What's his name? Galileo, you wouldn't know, would you? Galileo. There were people before him, but he did a good thing. And, no, no, there weren't people before. He was, I think, it. There were people after him. And then Isaac Newton produced mirrors as opposed to glass. So that was a change. Um, so Galileo said that the world is not about unpredictability, that the whole nature can be described by maths. And that's what they do in physics nowadays, right? Sort of. But what's really beautiful about this biologist from England, what did he do? He said, yes, he would say that, because he, th th those days they didn't have a field of biology developed as it is, if he saw what we see. Isn't it lovely? I would have never, I mean, I'm in the 21st century and I watch everything on YouTube, and when I thought Galileo said maths, all I could think of is all those bloody physicists are doing everything in maths too, right? So it's the same culture. Look at the genius. It sounds obvious what he said, but the obviousness is on the, like with a skater on the ice ring. It's easy, yeah, but you do it. <laughs> I 
I mean, the idea to say that Galileo would say it, wouldn't he? He didn't see biology the way we see, see it today. I thought it was brilliant. And that's the kind of thing. At 90, he was able to change his mind, continue learning, and so on. So, never, see, he understood that learning is nothing else, or living, it's continuously about managing one's in, the, the, the kinds of perspectives on which you build. Therefore, you go about expansion and never get worried about the challenge. You embrace challenge. You're not the only golden nugget. And thank God for it. Because you would be having people at your door all day, every day, go crazy. <laughs> all right. So we're a little bit still in the past with all of that, because this is still assignment one and very much going through the same thing over and over. Um, but what I wanted to do today with all of that, okay, well, I won't do it this way, will I? <laughs> so, what I wanted to do today is for us to think now with all of that that we have defined as a literate person. And we now can actually have a pretty good understanding how to answer assignment one, which says examples of you being literate, or if you're not being literate, that's you becoming literate. If you can see where you're not literate and you actually say it, that's you becoming literate. So seeing your path, it's already showing your strengths because you're no longer committed to the same over and over and over and over. And I have to write some things um, for myself, uh, which is, uh, all right. So with all of the things we know, and we have looked at my software and not my software, forget it, at this very moment, if you can't keep it in mind, can we think of little activities in schools we've seen or things you've done with your children that are expansive, enable children to follow, to, to, to identify challenges and follow them up, and therefore build the base on the basis of which they can make predictable solid, uh, or they can build solid predictions about what will happen, because that's how mind works. And in fact, if you actually look to some research, you'll find that we actually, we get so good at prediction that we know before we see, and that's how we can go forward. And it's not just us, a stupid fly does it. You could call it psychic if you wanted to. We see things before they happen, because that's how good we are at it. And the brain shows exact, the brain knows what will happen. Oh, it's the brain or the body, I can't remember. So the point is, your, whatever is managing all of this knows it before it actually registers it. And the brain also does another thing. <laughs> this is very interesting. The eye needs six quanta of the light to start telling your brain that it sees. Because what the brain does, brain sees one quanta, because we see in quantas. So it sees all of them before, but because it's still not enough, it's not gonna signal to you. It sees it, they've, they've recorded the brain, see, that the eye sees it. By the way, we don't see with eyes, but there is a light coming in and all of that. So the, the eye sees the first quantum, the one quanta, or one quantum of light. But it's not going to signal to your brain yet until it sees, sees, sees six of them, because then it can make these ch -ch -ch networks, and it's got enough of it so that your brain can make sense out of it. Ingenious. 